Welcome into UGA Football Live with J.C. Shelton, where the dogs come to talk. What's up, y'all? UGA Football Live with J.C. Shelton back with another episode here in your offseason of Georgia football. And I got an exciting guest. He's become a friend of the show, one of my favorite guys to talk to, so knowledgeable about Georgia sports and, and you know, former NFL player as well, former All-American for Georgia. And that's John Theus, um, former tackle for the Georgia Bulldogs and played with a lot of guys who you've seen on this show. John, it's great to see you, man. We, we appreciate you taking your time. Uh, first off, you know, how are you? Uh, I know you're working on something special that you got going on. We want to hear about it. Yeah, JC, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I always enjoy talking with you and, and talking ball. Uh, we'll talk a little non-ball to start. I uh, appreciate the segue. Uh, so uh, my partners and I are in the process of opening Scooters Coffee and Winder. Uh, what is Scooters? Scooters is a national um, franchise with 600 locations nationwide, but we're one of the first in the state of Georgia. So we're excited about bringing it to Winder. And uh, what makes us unique is we're drive through only. So that allows us to focus on um, speed, quality, and customer service. Um, so any of you folks out there in the Winder area will be off of East May Street. And, and um, for any folks that might be commuting from Atlanta to Athens on game days or home, um, we are not far, about five minutes off of 316. So we'd love to see you all when we're open. Um, you can check us out in the menu on uh, scooterscoffee.com. Um, a wide range of uh, drinks. I'll tell you our signature drinks are Carmelicious, which is a, um, you can get a hot icer blended. So latte, ice latte or the blender which is a milkshake consist consistency, um, as well as a lot of other drinks. Um, and uh, to tie it to football, I'll be in the quarterback position in the store. I'm the general manager that will be there every day. So I'll be a uh, close position, close to the window there. So if any of you dog fans come by, please uh, give me a go dogs through the window. I I'd love to see y'all come out and uh, say hello to you. Yeah, you get your little caffeine. You get to see a former Bulldog. That's a pretty cool situation there, especially you guys coming from you know Atlanta, Right there in Winder, too, as well, coming to game day on the way. Stop you by and say hey to John. Um, we appreciate it, man. Yeah, let, let's go into it. I, I really want to center this episode around a question, and that is, you know, why will Mike Bobo succeed? You know, from past conversations with you, I think you think that. I want to hear why from your standpoint as a former player under Mike Bobo, you know, in and out of the office, you call it, every day for for a while right and and you know why do you think that he takes this team coming off of two national championships um an offensive coordinator and Todd Monken who's now with the Baltimore Ravens who was there for three seasons who built his offense he built his scheme into this program what what questions do you have um uh, of this team going forward with Mike Bobo at, at the helm do you think is he going to get it done this upcoming season with with a lot of expectations on the line here. Yeah, I mean, it's a unique situation with Coach Bo. He's a UGA grad uh, and, and former player. Um, he coached at Georgia for a while. And then also he spent um, the last year, two, mm -hmm. year, two years, one year? Year. On staff with the offense. And while he wasn't the offensive coordinator, he was very much involved. So he knows the offense that Coach Munkin ran. Um, while I personally like Coach Bobo, I played with him for three years. Um, I think his ability to identify a defense's weakness and attack it um, is one of his strengths. Um, an example I would give is when we played Clemson at home um, the second time in the series when I was there, I think it was 2014, maybe 2013. Um, but Vic Beasley was on that team, uh, first round draft pick, all American, I believe. Great pass rusher, kind of a twitchy uh, jump around the block type of guy. Um, Coach Bobo saw that. Um, he, he heard us the year before, but Coach Bobo saw that. And um, so, what do we do that game? We ran sweeps in his direction uh, the whole game. And our stable of running backs um, ran all over Clemson that game. Um, it was, I think it was one of Nick Chubb's coming out parties. Yeah, they lost the shoe. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that, um, I think Coach Bobo can be creative with the play calling. You pair that with um, some of the weapons he has now, um, you know, especially like the tight end position. I think he'll get creative and, and, and use those guys. Um, one of the things I always admired about Coach Bobo that I didn't really learn till later in my career what he was doing is I think he knows and understands the strengths and limitations of his personnel, um, especially when it comes to offensive line play. Um, and he's going to put his guys in a position to succeed. So if he has an example, a, a 
a tackle that struggles with the backside cutoff on a two eye and the team runs that front a lot. Um, he's not going to put that, that lineman in that position um, to fail. Um, so I think he knows the limitations of his offensive line, but also the strengths and he'll play to that. Um, on top of that, he's a great motivator, which I know coach smart is as well. Um, but some of the best pregame speeches I've ever been a part of was came from coach Bobo. Um, but also uh, my situation with coach Bobo was unique because I came in as a freshman uh, maybe needed a little bit more motivation then um, than I did my junior year with him. Um, so he he was tougher on me then. Um, and then as I learned and got more comfortable with the offense and gained his respect, um, you know, it became a little bit more of a um, a lax uh, relationship. He he knew he could coach me in a different way. Um, so he's a good motivator, knows how to motivate different guys. Um, and then what's going to be interesting, I think this year, I know we had some talented offenses when I played. Um but I think as a whole, the Georgia team and some of the weapons that are on that Georgia offense now are weapons that he has not had um, when he was at Georgia, especially at that tight end position. Um, depth at receiver. Um, so he has a lot of weapons that he can use. Um, and then just also just being with the team last year. like He, he knows the offense that they've been running. He's going to try to make it simple for those guys. Any changes he wants to implement, he'll, um, he'll take that consideration. So having the familiarity with the guys is huge. Um, and just knowing like the offense that they ran last year. So I, I have high expectations um, for coach Bobo, especially with after we saw in the, the spring game sound with Carson Beck. Yeah, I think I do as well. And I think most of that opinion is based off of talking to guys like you and players that played underneath Bobo at Georgia in his first stint as OC right there from 07 to 14. Um, I think, you know, some of the concerns that came out straight away from Bobo be hired from people uh, was, you know, the ups and downs, it seemed like, during his tenure there. I think, you know, a lot played into that, you know, um, especially on the defensive side of the ball when you look at the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Recruiting it, the recruiting level is nowhere near it is right now. The talent, mm -hmm. even though he had a lot of those skill guys and a, one of the SEC's all-time best quarterbacks, um, mm -hmm. And, and even Matthew Stafford there for a moment as well. Um, even though he had those guys, it's not even comparable to what the the depth at each position he has now to play with. Um, yeah, yeah. Offensive and, line especially, I mean, the, the freshman John Theus doesn't start on the this team or or uh, the past few years teams. I mean, the, the depth of that positions and skill that they have is um, it's light years ahead of what we had when I was there. Yeah, I mean, even look at the example of Amarius Mims. Right, a guy's had some playing time, but he's been playing behind some really talented guys and guys in the NFL right now. Right, just got drafted, and I just saw him projected as a first round pick, late first round pick. So they they assume he's going to step in, and just from his measurables and the, the tape that he put out towards the end of the year last year, um, that this young kid is going to really start one season for Georgia, and then go first round in the NFL. So, and the depth at the offensive line is very apparent. I mean, they should have won the best offensive line award this past year, gave it to Michigan, even though we allow fewer sacks in more games. Um, we're finalists the year before as well. Uh, during don't the get started on Joe Moore. <laughs> <laughs> I've, yeah, the voters, man. I don't know. They need to they need to expand this voting pool. But hit, hit up your boy. I'll try not to be biased. Uh, <laughs> so I think there's, there, there was a concern there with the ups and downs during Mo Bobo's first tenure there. But he had some of the best offenses in Georgia history the time he's like points per game wise yards per game wise and the things he did with the running game um you know I, th I think he's also evolved if you look at from that time and then uh, see what he ran at south carolina um it was a garbage fire in auburn I'm not going to bring that up i mean there's a lot of issues that everybody knows about now that yeah. i don't think you can put on the oc um but i think that he you look at the numbers and you, you talk to the players that have played with him played underneath him um, and then I, I think that you can't think this is a bad move. I, I just don't agree with the people who are saying that. And then you add, like you brought it up there, he's been on staff for a year. Um, you know, he worked with Todd Monken. He was involved in the game planning. Monken, I think you mentioned to me before that he was actually very useful in a couple of times in the postseason in identifying defense uh, weakness, maybe coming up with a play, play suggestion, and, and Monken credited him with that. Um, I think that's big when you think about the grand scheme of things. Um, and then the, also the position coats that are still there, right, at, at Georgia. You have Dell McGee at running back still and, and running game coordinator. Um, 
you you have Todd Hartley there who's doing some great things with tight ends and tight end recruiting. Um, and, and the, the weapons at tight end, the ways you can use those guys as a blocker and, and a pass catcher and even a runner. We've seen Brock Bowers um, get, get a few carries his way as well, and Oscar Delp and Lawson Lucky I think can can add some uh, strength to that as well. And you look at that it just from the position group of the coaches, um, I think it all looks good from that standpoint. Um, and Brian McClendon there with the receivers, you know, former Bulldog himself. So it's like a like a little homecoming there. And I think that's where Georgia under Kirby Smart has done a good job of finding guys who love the Georgia program, who are Bulldogs at heart, a lot of them. Um, and it kind of translates to how the players play and represent the G. And you kind of see that on Saturdays and how they even talk to the media and talk on these different podcasts they go on. Um, so I, I think the move is good. And I'm expecting a lot here from this team because of the depth around and then you know he added a couple of really good sec receivers who led their teams in receiving last year and rara thomas from mississippi state and dominic love it from missouri i'm really excited to watch him in the slot um and you can even spread lad out there and, and put dominic in the slot let him run some yeah. cutback routes and get get those defenders moving and force and really force the defenses to add another another defensive back um and then we'll run the ball right up their throat with the running back stable that we have so i i think it all points to a, a good season um i don't think there'll be much drop off i mean carson beck looks so good but i think there will be some growing pains there the, the first start of the season i'm expecting um yeah. even though the schedule kind of lines up for the dogs they do play that south carolina as their sec season opener and everybody's gonna be hunting georgia right everybody's gonna be hunting georgia so they want to get it but um I, I think it looks good for these guys moving forward um any last thoughts here on my bubble do you, do you have a story I know you smile sometimes when you talk about him in pregame, like pregame speeches. Is there a story? I feel like there's something that comes up in your mind when you smile about that. No, I mean, um, man, I, I need to keep it PG is the, the problem. <laughs> no, I, I hey, just, you know. I'm not going to be one of the ones that leaks the uh, the Kirby Smart pregame. Uh, you can go PG-13, John. No, so, no. I mean, his, you could feel, and this sounds kind of probably cliche, but it's true. Um, you could feel like his passion pregame for um for 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 what he was saying. It was from the heart, you know. He might have thought of a few things he wanted to mention in the speech, but I mean, he was just rolling with it. Um, you know, about going out there. It's uh, it was always, you know, we got each other's back. You know, these guys think this about you. You know, what you're gonna go out there and do? But it, it was always positive. It was never like a, a um, never tried to motivate by you know. Uh, telling someone they weren't capable of doing something. It was always like positive, but but what I loved about Bobo is you never doubted if he had your back or not. Um, so like, it, it, for instance, it, after if you lose a game, you get on the bus, the coaches are in the front of the bus, they're the first people you see, and Bobo would be the first one to say, hey, we got this, all right? We're in this together, we got it. And that following Monday in this meeting, when it might be time to point out some uh, errors, you know, it started with Coach Bubba saying, look, this is what I messed up, this, this, and this. I shouldn't have done that. I should have trusted you here. I screwed us here. Should have won the game, and I held us back. And then he'd go into, you know, coaching us up. So I always respected him for that. Um, but pregame, it was along the lines of maybe some of the elite Coach Smart pregame speeches. Yeah, that's what um, reminded me. That that story you just brought up right there, just kind of talking about his pregame, it just reminds me of Kirby Smart. Because we've oh, all seen those clips, right? Yeah, so, and those guys go way back, man. And you talked about the the group of coaches that, that have history together. And I, I do think that's worth something. I mean, mm -hmm. all coaches want to win, right? But, I mean, they do have that connection to the University of Georgia. And I, I do think that means something. Um, and there are some very good coaches. I mean, you mentioned Coach Hartley earlier. And I always, um, as an offensive lineman, I always respect a tight end that will stick his nose into a block and execute it. And uh, Coach Hartley – I know he's got guys that can catch the ball and score, but he's got guys that aren't afraid to block either. And that's a mm -hmm. tackle's best friend. So when you have coaches like that too on your offensive staff, I mean, it helps. It helps big time. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, there won't be any lack of motivation pregame in that 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 locker room for Georgia. No, no. And for all you remember, the Titans fans out there, attitude reflects leadership. Okay, <laughs> that's what I think. I, that's what I think uh, points towards you know how these guys kind of play. Four guys like Kirby and Brian McClendon um, and Mike Bobo, I think, leads into that. Let's uh, let's jump right into the next topic here. I want to talk some SEC scheduling. So for those of you who watched the last show with Aaron, uh, we talked a little bit about SEC scheduling and I recorded that on Wednesday night, I think. And then the next day, the SEC announced the scheduling. 
Um, so we didn't get a chance to talk about that. Yes, yeah, go ahead and jump into it. I know if you listened, me and Aaron kind of debated the eight versus nine game schedule. How will it affect rivalries if it does at all? Um, and this really all stems from Texas and Oklahoma joining a year early in 24 instead of previously planned 25 that paid a bunch of money to the Big 12 there to come over early. Um, you know, right now, as it stands for the 24 season, no divisions, which is crazy to think of. It's yeah. always it's always West and East. Um, no divisions, eight game schedule, top two teams play in the conference championship. Um, let's go ahead and open it with your thoughts. Do you think they made the right move? What do you like about it? What do you not? Yeah, overall, I think it's a good move. I think it's um I think it's better for um us as fans. Uh I think we'll have um a lot more exciting home games and away games. I mean, the opportunity to play uh the old West schools um more often, home and away. I think Georgia fans travel well. I think Georgia fans will um, love the opportunity to go to some of those some of those other stadiums that um yeah, I mean you throw Texas and Oklahoma in the mix that uh, don't know if we've ever played at their stadiums possible back in the day. I know we've maybe back in the day. I need to look yeah. that up. I know we played Texas in a bowl game, but not, you know, mm-hmm. at the school, but, you know, just imagine um, not having to play Vanderbilt every year and, and having any school from the SEC West playing one of those teams instead. Uh, just imagine something like that. I mean, what it does is a home game locally for the excitement, the game day atmosphere, um, you know, just if you're watching on TV, it's much more exciting. You're looking forward to it. Uh, the local businesses, I think, would benefit big time to having all a lot more people in town. But overall, for those purposes, I'm excited about it. Um, the eight game versus nine game um, ordeal, I think me and you talked about it a little bit before. But, um, you know, it sounds like there's room for changes. And um, the SEC might, you know, be slow playing a little bit. And the, the commissioner's point of, uh, look at what the SEC's done in the past. I don't, the eight game schedule isn't going to make a difference for us. Um, maybe a little bit ar- arrogant, but true. Um, the SEC mm-hmm. has the power to do that. So, I mean, we could see the nine game schedule in the future, but overall, I'm excited about it. Um, you know, as far as rivalries go, um, it's weird. It's, it, when you talk about Georgian rivalries, I think different generations have different. Different generations of Georgia fans have different, you know, number one rivalries in their mind. For myself, it's Florida being from Jacksonville is part plays into that. But, you know, the recent battles we've had with them, um, older generations might be Georgia Tech and different folks. It's Auburn. It also depends on where you live. So there's a lot of rivalries. Some people would argue you can only have really one true rivalry, and that's Georgia Tech. But it, they've been so bad recently, it doesn't matter. So, you know, the thought of, you know, not having like a Florida or an Auburn or a Tennessee every year, I mean, hopefully those games stay around. Um but, you know, that does stink a little bit. But I think overall it's a good direction. There's going to be some growing pains. Um, some fans, you know, their rivalry game that means more to them might uh, not be an every year game. Um, but I think that's just going to be part of it. We'll have to adjust. But I think overall we'll look back on this as a, um, a positive move for the University of Georgia, the SEC, and college football as a whole, at least at the Power Five level. Yeah, and it's interesting to think as well, you know, 24 season. You know, that's what the SEC outlined there. And, you know, from Greg Sankey's comments, SEC commissioner, of course, sounded like that leaves room for in 25 having something different. Maybe along the same lines, we don't know what they're going to keep, what they're going to scrap. Maybe they'll see how it goes. But mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, obviously after this season, they're going to have to plan for the next. So I don't know if they have time to do that necessarily. Um, you know, the rivalries right now, as it stands from the official report, as well as Greg Sankey's comments, the rivalries are going to stay at least in the 24 season. So they actually, they have the flexibility to actually schedule these rivalries out. Um, and that's what it sounds like. They're going to keep that for a year, but moving forward, you know, does that, does it come a time yeah. where those kind of get scrapped? Maybe like you said, everybody kind of has their traditional rivalry. I feel like Georgia, Florida is, even if you like, maybe you hate Tennessee a little bit more, you still can't think that that's not Florida. Right. Um, yeah. But I, for me, I love to keep Florida, Tennessee, Auburn. That's, I think that's uh, a lot of people would kind of agree with me on that. Um, I think that's really important for me. And I think it's important for a lot of the college football fans. I mean, because when this came out, that was everybody's main concern, right? A lot of, you know, scroll through Twitter. That's most of the comments were about robberies. You know, how are they going to keep these games? You know, maybe if they go to four pods in the future, I kind of like that one. Um, yeah. You know, maybe they can keep, you know, your traditional and you make permanent um, opponents and you, you get to play other teams 
Uh, I think right now, from the 24 standpoint, even though it might change moving forward, um, the SEC says that you're going to play each team every two years, and it's going to be a home-and-home. Home. Um, so I do like that. I mean, you mentioned it there. Texas, Oklahoma, going to there, going to A&M, which got to play yet. You know, I, I, I'd i love to do that for sure. I mean, I want to go down there, even though it's you know far. But it would be really fun because that just makes – it more exciting. It's always exciting on game day when you're playing a program like that and a historic program. It only gets the juices flowing a little bit more. So I, I do like that and I agree with you on that. Yeah, I mean, um, it does. I mean, you've made this point to me before. It makes for a tougher schedule, um, but I think us as college football plant fans will adjust on the fact that a one loss, losing a game isn't the end all be all anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, I guess we've kind of slowly done that last few years with the playoff but i mean you, you mentioned before about the playoffs um expanding to 12 teams yeah so with the tougher schedule i mean it's not the end all be all um obviously you want to have a better seed um but if you don't have the better seed hosting a playoff game in athens georgia if you're a uh if if, if you're one of those teams without i can't remember how it's structured without the buy you, you know there's going to be some some playoff games i think hosted in, in college towns yeah that sounds like fun. Love uh, that. Love so, that. Yeah. I mean, I think about some of the years I played, we would have made a 12 team playoff and, and some of those years mm -hmm. of a playoff game in Athens. So um, just the fact that, you know, you, you take the trade off of a tougher schedule with the fact that more teams in the playoffs. Uh, I think that ultimately just helps the SEC. Um, you know, the, the, we always, other, other uh, teams, fans might argue with this, but we beat each other up. You can't, you can't logically argue with that. Um, the SEC beats each other up, and it affects um, postseason has forever back to the BCS gate days. Mm -hmm. Now the fact that the playoffs expanding it helps us. You know, you, you match up a an eight seed SEC school with I don't know what, what it would be a six seed, four seed. I don't know what it is from the Pac-12. I think we're going to see uh, you know the continued success of the SEC in those situations. So I think ultimately it, it helps us um, yeah. with expanding the playoff, even though there is going to be a stronger schedule. Yeah, I was just about to mention you know, the playoffs expanding and how this relates to it. Um, the eight game versus nine game, the criticism, I, criticism, I can't talk today. Criticism I've seen there is you have you know an eight game schedule for maybe a, right a team SEC team right on the bubble of that twelve, and then they get exited because of a Big Ten team, what have you, that played more conference games, same record maybe, and they get in over it. That's very niche situation there. Um, but, you know, we don't know if we're going to see a nine-game schedule in 25. I mean, it's just right now all we know is 24, and we yeah. know that I think five teams voted in the SEC for that nine-game conference schedule this past spring meetings, and one of them was Georgia. Yeah. So interesting to me, will more teams want to do that moving forward? We'll see. I, I don't think, like you said, it's the end-all, be-all. I think, you know, we could see that this works out great for the SEC. But mm -hmm. it's it's fun to talk about right now, something a new cycle during off season. You always want to expand yeah. on it. But – you know, I, before we leave, John, I, I, you told me this story the other day, and I want to make sure we bring it up here on the yeah. show about your one of your seasons here at, at, for the 49ers. I believe it's your first season, right? You were getting ready for your first start, and you played a certain guy on a certain team and had a situation, and I think the viewers would love to hear about it. Yeah, uh, so J we were talking, and JC asked me about, you know, what was – kind of like a rookie mini uh, kind of like a hey rookie welcome to the NFL moment was kind of the way the question was phrased and uh the example I gave was I, I my first game that I started on the offensive line was against the Rams it was in December later in the season um our all pro future hall of fame tackle Joe Staley had gotten hurt so I got the start um uh, which I was ex excited about obviously but um it was against the Rams and um the Rams have debatably the the best NFL defensive lineman ever, Aaron Donald. Um, so, you know, going into the game, I was a little anxious and nervous that uh, they were going to line Aaron Donald up against the rookie tackle starting his first game, the whole game. Thankfully, they didn't do that, but there was um, a few times I had to uh, attempt to block him. Um, one of those times we were running a, an inside zone play away from me, so I was on the backside cut off. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier, Bobo playing to the strengths and weaknesses of his offensive line. Uh, well, one of my weaknesses that game was trying to cut off Aaron Donald, uh, which it is just the fact that it's Aaron Donald. So anyways, I'm, I'm trying to cut off Aaron Donald on the backside of an inside zone play, giving it all I have. Um, 
you know, I, I mean, I'm 110% into this trying to have good, I mean, I take a good first step, I get good position, and then I'm, you know, I'm feeling good, one arm up on my chest plate, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and he just starts laughing, and uh, a lot of times, the guys will, like, talk trash, and even if you don't do a good job, you can talk trash back, well, that was the first time I'd ever been laughed at in the middle of a play, um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I just tucked my tail, and turned around, and went back to the huddle, um, because Aaron Donald's not a guy that you want to get into a trash talking, uh, <laughs> about with you don't want to make him any any more mad than he is when he plays a game but uh it was definitely a uh an eye-opening moment where you realize there's I already knew there's levels to the game but he's like at the top level and I mean he's like six two six one maybe 280 pounds but he's just solid um and, I mean he was just effort effortlessly one arm stalemating me as I was giving my all so it was a uh it was an eye-opening experience and a funny story that I, I do enjoy telling um that was a humbling to me in my first start in the NFL. Yeah, I, I love those stories so much because you're, you know, this huge, like over 300 pound tackle. And, you know, he's like 280 playing in the middle of the trenches with these nasty guys. And it yeah. just makes so much sense as that dude will be able to hold you up. No offense, John, but I mean, he is the best probably. Yeah, uh, he's real. He, he is amazing. He's love amazing. watching him. Yeah. Well, well, we'll let you out on that, man. And I think it's good at any point. We'll get out of here. Appreciate you uh, taking the time. And guys, whether you're uh, listening on your podcast or watching on the Pulse Sports Network on YouTube, appreciate your views as well. Make sure to check out Scooter's Coffee. Yeah. All right. It's going to help you out, especially during the season, get you prepped for game days. Um, should be opening towards the end of the month if all goes to plan, according to John here. So make sure you step out and support a former Bulldog. We always love giving back like that. Uh, John, go dogs. We appreciate it, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, JC. Thanks for having me on, man. Go dogs. <laughs>